Hi, my name is Yoav Artsy, and I'll talk today about few shot object reasoning for robot instruction following. This talk is part of the workshop on spatial language understanding in EMLP 2020. Before I start, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me and for organizing this day. I mean, I'm looking forward to for the discussions and questions on the workshop day itself. The task that we are focused on today is uh, navigating between landmarks with a quadcopter drone. We use an Intel Aero drone, it's a relatively large drone. Uh, and the inputs that the system takes are the pose estimates of the drone. So these are six degrees of freedom pose estimates that give you the position of the drone in the 3D space, as well as its orientation. We also get raw RGB input from the onboard camera on the drone, it's here in the front, and natural language instructions that tell the drone how it should behave and how it should navigate an environment. Just to give you an idea, the, env the environment uh, is an environment that we are using. Uh, it requ it's a, it's a dro the drone cage is roughly five by five meter. Uh, it's a, it includes a number of objects that are randomly placed and are sampled from a larger set of objects. It's a relatively complex environment and we don't use any green screens or anything that simplifies uh, the perception problem, and as you will see in some of the videos, you can even see uh, students walking around the cage, uh, or, in my, or, or uh, and the student is working on the project while uh, sitting next to the computer. This is the first person view that is not available for the drone. Instead, the drone sees this first person RGB image, and in this environment, the drone follows instructions like go straight and stop before reaching the planter, turn left towards the club, and go forward until just before it. And this is an execution of our of our. Uh, of our system. Uh, this is our drone. It starts from here and it's going to fly until, uh, in this case, it executes the instruction correctly, gets to the goal position, and then stops and indicates it completed the instruction. So just a slightly more formally, the drone uh, is controlled by a very low level controller that maintains a configuration of uh, two target velocities, a linear forward velocity and an angular yaw rate. Uh, these are two, row num uh, two real numbers, and each action our model takes updates, these, updates the configuration by setting, it to, uh, setting these two uh, real numbers with new values, or select the stop action to indicate a task completion. And we're going to continuously run our model to continuously update uh, these numbers until it, it takes the stop action. Our goal is to learn this mapping. So our model is a mapping, it's a function from natural language instructions, our six degrees of freedom pose estimates, and the first person view uh, from the drone. This is our RGB images. And we we, what we want to do is we want to learn the mapping to, this, uh, to continuously output these a configuration update, and then once we get to the goal, take the stop action and bring the drone to a halt. The way this problem, this this large, this uh, overall problem is addressed in robotics usually is using a modular approach, where you take this large problem and de decompose it into sub-problems like perception, mapping, language understanding, planning, and control, and you build different um, separate models or components to address each of these sub-problems. And this usually inc includes designing a symbolic meaning representation, for example, to, to uh, represent the meaning of language. And then you combine them all together in a relatively complex and engineering heavy integration process. In general, this process is, is, is a heavy on the engineering side and it's very difficult to scale to real life complex environments. Recently, we proposed to address this problem with a single model approach that is sometimes called the end-to-end -end approach, where, you where the inputs are the uh, instructions, the RGB values from the onboard camera, and the pose estimates. And we want to learn a single function that maps all the way from these inputs to the model actions. And, we, so, and this entire function is learned, and it's learned from demonstrations. Now, the fact that we are, but the fact that we are learning this this function doesn't mean that we have to give up on, on some of the advantages that modularity proposes. And this is and this is the focus of the talk today. How can how should we think about uh, issues that uh, issues like extensibility, interpretability, and modularity when we when we pack everything into a single model that we learn from scratch? And the approach I'll present today uh, addresses a. Uh, those three aspects, extensibility, interpretability, and modularity. The model I'll show extend, is, is able to be, ex, uh, uh, you can extend it to reason about new objects after training without any additional uh, fine tuning or training of the model. It's, it, it, provides an it provides a certain level of interpretability by providing a view of how the model reasons about object grounding and the trajectories it plans to take. 
And finally, it provides a certain level of modularity by potentially allowing reusing parts of the model in other systems. And it does the whole, and it, it, it achieves these three goals within a representation learning framework without giving up on the benefits of, uh, of learning. But if we contrast the presentation design versus learning, we see that the systems that use manually, manually designed, handcrafted symbolic representations are generally more interpretable because their reasoning space is structured by experts. They are, potentially ex they are also potentially extensible, although most systems do not show this, and they're easier to learn because of the very strong inductive bias that is engineered into the system. However, engineering the representation of every possible concept is extremely brittle and very hard to scale. So instead, what we, what we do is we take a middle ground approach and we say, and, and we, uh, we propose to design the most general concepts and let representation learning fill them with content. And today we're gonna to talk about two major concepts. Uh, that are really basic to instruction following, objects and trajectories. So the talk will be divided into three parts today, but overall what we're going to do is we're going to build a few short instruction following quadcopter drone that maps our inputs into continuous, into, uh, continuous control actions. In the first part, I'll, slice a, I'll take a part of this problem uh, and, and, and propose to solve it using a few short language conditioned object segmentation method. This is a general language conditioned segmentation method that can be extended using, uh, using exemplars to do a few short reasoning. I'll show how you, and the second part I'll show how you can take these segmentations and construct a map of the environment that, that captures the locations of objects and also how they are treated and how they, and how, in what context they appear in instructions. And, and finally, I'll take this map in the third part and I'll integrate it into a visitation prediction policy for mapping instructions to continuous control of a quadcopter drone. So, the, so let, let's formalize the language condition of the object segmentation problem. Our input are instructions and images, specifically because we, because we are focused on the larger problem of instruction following, I'm going to continuously show and talk about observation images, but in general, these can be any images. Our goal is to identify objects in the images and align them to a set of given references in, the, in, in natural language, specifically in our case, in the instructions. These references can be noisy. So for example, here we have two references, the globe, which is a pretty clean reference, and the planter turn, which is a noisy reference because it also, it, it also uh, took this uh, adjacent word turn that is not really part of the, ob of the object reference, the planter. And what we want to do is we want to, we want to, ex we want to align these references to objects in the environment and segment these objects. And we want, and we want to, uh, uh, and we want to do it, con and we want to uh, identify this object at the same time. So as we can see here, as the as uh, this is from our drone, as the drone flies, we see this sequence of images. And what we are doing is we are taking these references that are that we are given and map them to objects in the environment, and we get this like explicit alignment that allow us to see how the how the how the drone in this case that we are that how, that we'll have when we combine this approach into a policy later on, reasons and grounds, uh, reasons about ob object references and grounds them in the environment. I, I want to extend this, uh, this a bit and, and talk about what would be a few short version of this problem. So now the input is, an, is, is a natural language instruction, in our case, Im images from observations for us, and a database. This database includes objects, and for each object it includes a number of uh, exemplar images showing how it looks, and a number of exem exemplar phrases showing how, it's usually ref how it may be referred in language. We're talking about like, like a, a very small number. In our experiments, we use five images and five natural language exemplars. Our goal is to identify previously unseen objects and their, mention, and their references or mentions in the, in the language and align them together. So it's a few shed version and this, this whole reasoning process is happening via the database. So the approach is that we are going to align observations of objects and references in language through the database. And that means that if we add objects to the database, we are essentially extending the, ability, the, the alignment ability of the system. So if we want to be able to reason about previously unseen objects, all we have to do is add a few images and language exemplars into our database. In order to do this alignment, we, uh, we compute an alignment score. 
So and, and our, li our alignment score is between a bounding box B and a reference in the language R. And here I'm going for the, the, for the example, I'm going to illustrate over this bounding box that we uh, get, that we compute for the planter and the reference the planter for, that we are given for the natural language instruction. This, align, this alignment score is, uh, is done uh, via the database and, I'm going, and I denote each object in the database as O. So this score is marginalized over all possible, uh, all objects in the database and it's computed as a, as, a, as a combination of two quantities, two probabilities. The probability of a bounding box B given an object, a database object O and the probability of a database object O given a reference in the text R. Now, despite the fact that this alignment score is constructed using probabilities, it's not a probability in itself because it's not appropriately uh, normalized. Uh, it's, just, it's simply a numerical score, but the nice thing about it, because it's probabilities, we are going to get this like bounded uh, numerical score, which will really help uh, later on when we use this approach in, uh, within a, a complete policy. Now we can take this uh, alignment score and we can rewrite it using Bayes' rule and now we have four quantities. These are the four quantities we're going to compute. We have, the, we have, the, we have on, the, on the right the probability of an object given a reference, that, like before, and we have these three quantities which we get from Bayes' rule. We have the probability of an object given a bounding box. We have a probability of a bounding box and we have the probability of an object. And so to compute this alignment score we have to formalize how we compute or learn these different quantities. So the first, so the first thing we need to do is we need to get a uh, bounding boxes for a, a, from our image and that and we do this using a region proposal network that we train. This gives us the bounding boxes and it's always give, it's also gives us the probability attached to each bounding box that tells us the probability that this bounding box is an object. Now this is not exactly the probability of the, the, the PB, the probability of the bounding box, but uh, it's a, it's a sufficient uh, it's sufficiently uh, effective proxy. So we're going to use that value we get from the region proposal network as PB, and we're going to assume that PO, the probability of an object, is uniform over all the objects in the database. So this gives us two of the four quantities we have, two of the four quantities that we have to compute. The, the third quantity is the probability of an object O given a bounding box B that we have here. We compute this using a visual similarity measure. So we, we are going to learn a visual similarity metric and then we use kernel density estimation with symmetric multivariate Gaussian kernels that marginalizes for each object over all its exemplars uh, that in the database. For the fourth quantity, the probability of an object giving a reference, we compute this using a very similar, uh, a, 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 a similar process. This time we use a text similarity measure uh, with pre-trained uh, word embedding. So uh, specifically we use glove word embedding. The final thing we have to do given this alignment score, because, because remember we are interested in, uh, in, in object masks and not bounding boxes, so we want a tighter uh, fit to the object, we're going to refine, we're going to refine each bounding box with a unit model that we learn. Unit is a very common architecture that is used for segmentation uh, and, uh, and, and the mask prediction in vision. And this gives us a tight object mask. And this object mask that we see here is, is, is paired with a reference in the text with some kind of alignment score that we get from our alignment. Okay, so this process uh, entails uh, several learning problems. We have to learn the region proposal network parameters that give us the bounding box proposal as well as a, as a, as a numerical value that we use as a proxy for, for PB, the probability of a bounding box. We use an image, we need to, we need to estimate the, the, the uh, parameters of an image similarity measure that will allow us to compute the probability of O given B, an object in the database given a bounding box. And we need to estimate the parameters for the unit architecture that allows us to, uh, to refine the bounding boxes into masks. We don't need to estimate, we, we, for, for the text similarity measure to, to, that we use to compute P of O given R of the object database, uh, object, refer, object in the database giving a text reference, there is nothing to train, we, we just simply do this using a uh, glove embeddings, uh, so our pre-trained embeddings. 
the challenge in learning these uh, these free elements uh, of uh, is that we really need large scale heavily annotated visual data uh, data with bounding boxes with uh, with uh, masks for refinement with a uh, similarity between uh, between different images and we want this and we need this and we need a lot of this data because we need to generalize beyond specific object properties because what we want to do is remember we want to do a few short reasoning to reason about objects that we haven't seen before uh, during testing time so we're not going to collect this data instead of collecting this data and, and and annotating it which is a big effort we are going to generate this data and we, we do this using augmented reality techniques we take our drone and we fly it in the environment in an empty environment so we just get a, a, a empty cage without any objects this gives us a lot of images in the environment from just a small number of uh, of uh, of uh, trajectories that we collect we then use a uh, models a uh, 3d uh, 3D models of objects to create an overlay where we put different objects in the environment and we combine this overlay with the first person view to create a composite image that 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 has the environment and objects per and and 3D synthetic objects distributed in the environment because we generated this overlay we can also generate labels in, specifically in this example for the masks itself but we can get bounding boxes and and uh, and all, all possible uh, other labels for all the tasks that we need to learn we generate a lot of this data using a, a shape net object so this is a large repository of uh, 3d objects and then we can what we, what this allows to do is it allows to learn the presentation that generalize beyond the specific object properties so we have, and this allows us to estimate the region proposal network, the image similarity measure, and the unit parameters for the mask refinement. Okay, so in the first part, I talked about, the, I formalized the problem of few shot language condition of ob object segmentation. This problem is similar to resolve to a, a referring expression resolution, but it's not exactly the same because we really need to, we need, we need to, ide we need to, we are talking about, we are interested in small phrases inside a larger sentences which are uh, instructions and we are interested in like this very tight mask rather than bounding boxes now i'm going to take this uh, segmentations and i'm going to uh, and i'm going to construct a map out of them that also incorporates natural the natural language information about how this language should be used so our goal is to create a map that captures the object location in the environment and the instruction behavior around this object. This process uh, includes four steps. We first identify and align objects mentioned to observation. This is done using the process I just described. We then compute abstract contextual representation for the object references from the instructions by incorporating the context and abstracting over any specific properties of the object. We then have a very simple deterministic process of projecting these masks into the world reference frame and aggregating over time. And finally, we combine these aggregated masks with the contextual information from the language to create our map. So let's see how, how this is done and illustrate using examples. So in the first step, we get bounding proposal networks from a region proposal network. We get object references from a tagger. So given the instruction, we, 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 we ran a small tagger that we trained to identify uh, object references. And we get these alignments that, that we see uh, down here. And so we get a reference in the text aligned with masks in the environment of the of objects in the environment. And so this, so this gives us first person masks aligned to instruction references. In the second step, we take the instruction and we remove, we abstract over uh, the references that we have identified with our tagger by replacing them with placeholder tokens. So for example, if our instruction reaching the planter turn left towards the globe, we'll take this noisy reference, the planter turn, and we'll replace it with object A, and we'll take the globe and replace it with a token object B. Then we, co then we run a bidirectional RNN uh, that, uh, that, uh, that gives us representations for all the tokens, including these placeholder tokens. This RNN, uh, is some, is we, we are going to estimate its parameters later on when uh, together with the complete uh, policy. So it's going to learn representations that are specific for the task at hand. The hidden state for each of the placeholder tokens is what we call the object context representation. 
it abstracts over all the, ob the, the specific object information and its properties, like its identity and if it has any adjectives that are, that are paired with that. Uh, but it includes the words around it, which is the context that indicates how we should behave around this object. In the third step, we uh, project, we take our masks from step number one and we project and aggregate them. Uh, and you do, we do this using, a, it's, a, it's a deterministic process using a pinhole camera model for projection and some and, and a, a, specific, a, a very simple aggregator for accumulation. So what we do, we get our a, a, a first person masks that are aligned with references in the instruction. We then, uh, and this gives us this first person mask here. I'm just, here I'm showing just the mask itself without the background RGB image. We then project this mask using a pinhole camera projection. We can do it because we have, we, are get, we have the pose estimates that the drone receives. And this gives us a projected mask. So each of these masks is projected into a world reference frame. These projected masks are accumulated over time using an, a deterministic integrator. So given a mask at time t, we are going to combine it with the mask from the previous time step to combine, to, to, to create an aggregated mask for the current time step. So because in the first step, uh, we are getting the first mask, we don't have any mask from previously. So what we do is we just pass it through the integrator as is. And then we start by uh, taking this mask, moving into the mask from the previous time step and aggregating this over time until we get this mask over positions in the environment within the in, in the global reference frame now not in the first person view of the robot that show us where the masks are and how, each for each mask we know how it aligns to a reference in the instruction and these and these masks because they are in the world reference frame i can actually visualize them by overlaying them over a overhead view of the environment so you can see how we are detecting that uh, the pot here, but we also have some uh, some errors detect, uh, uh, detecting the fire truck as uh, as uh, with the same uh, segment uh, segmenting it as, as something that refers to uh, the planter, and later on we'll do the same thing, but for lesser degree with the strawberry. These the, the strawberry and the fire truck are generally less aligned because the alignment score is lower, but it's but still enough to uh, be included in the map. And the globe is once it's observed, it's the it's uh, aligns to uh, the globe in reference in the instruction. In the fourth step, we we, we take these masks and we combine them with a object with the object context representations that we got from the text. The way we do it is we take each position in the environment and we look at what masks are active and we basically multiply them using the alignment score with the uh, object context representation that we compute from the instruction. And this gives us an object context map. So this map is highlighting similar areas to the mask because, uh, of, because that's where the areas where the information from the instruction passes through once we multiply with the masks. But this information is now included in, in this position, this information is now a vector that captures the context of how this object is used in the instruction. So for example, here, this semantic, the semantic information here caption, captures information around object A, and the semantic information that will soon appear here for the globe captures information around object B. So this map information, to summarize, abstracts over refer reference content, which is stripped of the instruction. So everything that is within the reference, it includes for each object the context, the context of its reference in the instruction. So the, so the information from the words around us, and this basically tells the agent how to behave around the object. So the policy that the policy that, that I'm going to pr uh, present next, that with, that uses this map, remains blind to the object itself. All it sees is is, is this more generic behavior of of and more generic information of navigation behavior. Okay, so I described our few short language se language condition segmentation process. I showed how you take the segmentation and construct a map that captures contextual information about objects. And finally, I'm, I'll integrate this into a visitation prediction policy that maps uh, that that takes instructions. Uh, um, and maps them, a different sense of map, to a continuous control of a quadcopter drone. 
And it does this by explicitly reasoning about the trajectories that the drone takes in the environment, which, which provides us another level of interpretability and the second core uh, concept that we, are, uh, that we are reasoning here. So while the first, the first two parts explicitly model the notion of objects, the, second, the third part explicitly models the notion of a trajectory. Our policy is divided into two stages. It's a single neural network, um, but it's but the reasoning it performs can be divided into two stages with uh, interpretable representations in the middle. The inputs are the uh, instruction, the natural language instructions, the raw RGB observations from the onboard camera on the drone, the six degrees of freedom pose estimates, and this database and the database that allows us to do few shot uh, object segmentation. In the first stage, we map the environment and predict states where they're likely to visit and also track observability. And you can see that I put here as part of the first stage our few shot segmentation process that is tacked to this mapping and plan generation process. This process generates visitation distributions, which I'll uh, define uh, in a second, and an observation mask in the environment, which is deterministically generated using the properties of the camera and the pose estimate to tell us what parts, of the, what parts of the environment we observed. Given these two representations, we generate actions to visit hyperability states and explore the environment. And these actions are either our configuration updates, so two real numbers to update the, dr the drone uh, low-level controller, the drone uh, that holds the configuration, or the stop action to indicate task completion and bring the drone to a halt. Visitation distributions, uh, they kept, they, the visitation distribution captured the, the probability of uh, visiting a state S following a policy pi from a start, a start date S0. So in an ideal world, what we would like to predict is the, is the uh, visitation distribution for the expert policy, because this is going to tell us exactly for each state what's the probability that we are going to visit it while uh, executing, this, executing the instruction correctly. Of course, this is something we don't have access to. We only have access to demonstrations for learning, but this is kind of, this is kind of like the idealized behavior that we would like to aim for. Now, I'm not going to discuss this in detail, but in general, these distributions are computed via approximation of the state space. And depending on the quality of the approximation, we can bound the error that the policy learned. And I refer you to our paper for the details and the analysis of this, of this, uh, of this lemma. Now, we compute uh, two distributions, a trajectory visitation distribution and a goal visitation distribution. This distribution, they reflect the agent plan. And they model, uh, they, they also model the path and goal observability. So I'm showing here the first person observation. This is from where, this is the first person observation from where the drone starts. And I'm visualizing the distributions here. The distributions are, compute, are computed at the, the world reference frame. So they are basic, they are computed, they're going to be computed over the map that we generated. And we have two distributions here. We have a trajectory distribution in red, and we have a goal distribution in green. These distributions, each of the distributions also has an additional event, this, which is identified by the, these bars here. This event tells us how much of the probability mass should not be on a location, on, on a positions in the environment. So it basically tells us how much of the path in the, in the, go, in the uh, case of trajectory we did not observe, or how much of the goal we did not observe. So for now, we see that we observe this part of the path, but there is still a lot of mass for the trajectory because the drone is going to fly here and this part hasn't been observed yet. And we see that while the drone mistakenly puts some probability mass on a position in the environment, there is still a lot of, prob of, of probability mass on th of the goal distribution on the unobserved goal event, telling us that we probably need to do more exploration. These distributions, because they are computed at the world reference frame, I can actually visualize them and, and look at them as plans. So here I'm visualizing them, and you can see from the draw starting position here that it currently plans to fly here and potentially will stop here. What's, what, but, but these distributions are going to be conti are continuously refined as we observe more and more of the environment. So if, as the drones fly in the environment and observe more of the environment, we can see that it refines and moves more of the trajectory this uh, probability mass into positions in the environment and more of the goal observability mass into the into the position once it observes it and this brings this brings it to the right position and also provides us an idea of what is the plan of the drone at every point along the way given what it has seen of the environment so far so in the first stage of our policy we predict we, we map the environment and we and we uh, generate a plan 
uh, and, and we generate a plan by predicting these visitation distributions. So we have the few shot language condition segmentation process that allows us to construct the object context map. So this is the object context map, which I described earlier, and we also carry along the abstract instruction. This is the instruction with the specific references masked over. This, this map goes to a plan generation uh, network uh, that, that generates this uh, visitation distribution, and this process is cast as an image generation process. So the plan generation is an image generation process that uses an architecture called LinguaNet that we introduced in a previous paper. This is an image-to-image -image encoder decoder, and it allows us to do visual reasoning at multiple image scale, where the entire process is conditioned on the language in input at all levels using text-based convolutions. So how does this look? We get here the abstract instruction, and we compute an RNN representation for it, compute text kernels. We get our object context map, and we, run it, and we run it for a series of convolutions to, of, of decreasing size. Then we convolve using the text kernel over the feature maps at each of these levels. And we finally, we deconvolve the increasing size to generate an image of two channels, one for each distribution, that, uh, that is at the same dimension as the input map. So these distributions are, uh, and, th and then we put, we put these two channels each for soft max to get distributions that are over the positions in the environment that are captured by the map. In the second stage, we take, uh, once g g given these visitation distribution and also the observability mask that we accumulate over time deterministically, we generate action to visit high probability states and explore the environment depending on how much of the probability is assigned to these unobserved goal and path events. And the second stage is a relatively simple process. We have, it's a, it's a, it's a kind of, it's a simple control problem that doesn't require anything about the language or observations. We take our, our, our visitation distribution and we crop and transform them. So the agent is always facing in the same direction. So the agent is always facing up. We take our observability mask and we center it uh, and, and we center it and rotate it again, egocentric transformation. So the agent is always facing, is always centered and facing in the right direction in upward direction. And then what we can do, and you can always, is, is we can, then it's pretty simple to reason about the configuration update or the stop action that you need to take just by looking at like how the path and how, and what's the observability from where you are right now. So if the path is uh, moving in this direction, we would like to fly in that way and it will require a very local control uh, signal. And we do this using a number of CNNs and, mold, and, and uh, a full, uh, some fully connected layers. It's a relatively simple, shallow architecture. What this basically allows you to do is to have something that is very similar to a closed loop uh, controller, where you, do a, you rapidly do very small action and observe the results given by how they influenced your distributions and the observability to quickly, correct, to quickly correct yourself in order to get back to the path. So for training, we have, we, we have a number of uh, uh, sets of parameters that we need to estimate in order to train this policy. So the few set short segmentation component that is trained separately using the augmented reality data that I just saw, I just showed. The mapping component has this RNN that is used to get the context representation that appears in the object context map. This is something we, this is a, they estimate the parameters of this RNN together with the complete policy using demonstration data and reinforcement learning. We need to, for plan generation, we need to estimate the parameters of the LingoNet architecture. And for the control network, we have a number of layers of CNN and multi-layer perceptor. What we do is we train, in, we train the entire system in simulation. And the reason we can do this is we can, because the language condition segmentation is trained separately, we can actually train it separate. We can train two copies of it for simulation in the real environment. The policy itself, given this, the, the output of the language condition segmentation, doesn't really observe the raw RGB pixels from the environment. So we, so we can train it using the simulation language conditioned segmentation component without any access to the real world. And after training, simply swap the segmentation component and then evaluate, uh, and then just evaluate in, uh, in the real world uh, without any further fine tuning. So, so we, basically we basically skip the domain adaptation problem here by just swapping the segmentation component. 
The data that we are using are uh, demonstrations of instructions paired with executions, and we also have the ability to fly in the environment and observe the experience of what happens with, as the drone makes certain decisions in the environment uh, using a reinforcement learning process. So our architecture is a bit different. We replace this few short segmentation process with a simulation-based segmentation process rather than the real one, just for training, and later on we'll swap this one uh, we'll swap this, this, this segmentation component with the real-world segmentation component. And then and the nice thing about, about this component is because it's training augmented reality data, we can easily create a lot of this data in simulation as well. We, tra we train using an algorithm called Surreal that we introduced in, in, a, uh, in a Corel 2019 paper. It's a supervised and reinforcement asynchronous learning, where we run two learning processes that are asynchronous but constantly exchange information between them. And the goal here is to train each part of the each part of the network with the uh, learning algorithm that best fits the data it, it has access to. So for the first part, we use supervised learning, which is really good when, given the, the amount of limited language data we have. And for the second part, when we want to learn the dynamics of the find the dynamics of the controller, we use reinforcement learning in simulation, which allows us to uh, observe what happens uh, in reaction to drone behavior in the environment. Okay, so for supervised learning, our objective is to generate uh, visitation distributions, and we can easily uh, we can easily we have access to simulation states paired with visitation predictions. We can easily generate this from our demonstration, and we use and we use a very simple cross entropy loss there. For our reinforcement learning, we use PPO, a, a proximal policy a optimization. It's a pretty standard algorithm. The most important part here is that the, the reinforcement learning a, process does not require any extrinsic reward. So we don't need to measure task completion or instrument the environment. All we need to all we need to have is access to an intrinsic. All we need to do is compute an intrinsic reward, which basically a, rewards the system for following these distributions and exploring the environment as needed. These two processes, they run asynchronously, but they constantly exchange information. We periodically send parameters update for the first stage to the reinforcement learning process to, to be used for a rollouts uh, in PPO. And we, as we do rollouts in PPO, we treat those as demonstrations and send them to the supervised learning process. So what this gives us is that the first stage learns to predict visitation distributions based on noisy predicted execution trajectories. So the trajectories that we get are noisy, but we try to optimize them to predict the correct visitation distributions. The second stage learns to predict actions using predicted visitation distributions that are potentially noisy and look very different from the gold standard ones. For our experiments, we use an Intel Aero quadcopter, a Vicon motion capture system for pose estimate. The simulation is done using a Microsoft AirSim and the drone cage is roughly five by five meter. All evaluation is done with completely new objects, so we have eight new objects in the physical environment. The database that we use includes all these objects, and we have five images and five phrases as exemplars for each object. The training data includes roughly 40,000 instruction demonstration pairs. All in simulations, we use no demonstration data in the real world or the ability to fly in the real world during training. We did both automatic evaluation and human evaluation. I'm, I'm showing only the human evaluation because a, all the automatic metrics, although some are better than others, are not semantically uh, faithful completely to the, to the instruction. Only the human evaluation is guaranteed to be uh, completely reflect the semantics of the instruction. So what we did is we showed ex uh, recordings of executions to uh, workers on Mechanical Turk and asked them to rank them along a uh, uh, rank them on a, on a five-point Likert scale with regard to two questions. Did you get the, the goal right, uh, so just getting to the final position right, or did you get the complete path, or this was the complete execution correctly, including the goal? And this is a Gantt chart that represents the, the percentages for each uh, of uh, five uh, different systems for each question. So th there, are, there are five systems here. The one at the top is a non-learning baseline where uh, the drone flies to the in, uh, with the mean velocity through the, to the average amount of time as uh, induced from the training data. As you can see, it does pretty bad. The next one is a, a pre our previous approach uh, that uh, uses the position visitation network uh, but doesn't have an, the ability to reason uh, in, about new objects using a few short reasoning. And as you can see, when testing on these new objects, it actually performs pretty bad. So it's just slightly better than average. It gets good scores, so between four and five, four and five on the path score, uh, roughly 26% of the time, which is pretty low. 
Our next, uh, the next system is our approach. That's a few shot position visitation network, FSPVN. It performs significantly better. In absolute terms, it doubles the number of uh, the, amount, the, the amount of time that it gets a point of four or five on path score to 53% of the time. So this is double than PVN to sin. And this is really showing the effective generalization to unknown objects of our few shot segmentation approach. The next approach is a, our, our previous model, but trained on significantly more data that includes using all these new objects. And surprisingly, it, it, so it definitely performs better than a, the same model without a, this additional data, because now it knows the object and it has sufficient data to train on them, but it still performs worse than our approach. A, so roughly 10% uh, in uh, absolute terms less uh, of good scores, so between four and five on Likert scales. And this illustrates the benefit of the object-centric inductive bias that is built into FSB, FSBVN. Okay, I want to show several examples. I'm going to start with a relatively simple one and I'll then show me an interesting one at illustrating some of the uh, limitations of, of our approach. So in this, uh, so here I'm showing the instruction and move to the right side of the fire truck and looping around it until heading towards the globe, uh, the globe's left side. Uh, this is the robot. This is the drone's point of view. So this is what the drone sees, and this is a third-person view that the drone doesn't see. I'm visualizing here the visitation distribution over an overhead view. In green, it's the goal distribution, and in red, it's the trajectory distribution. This bar on the right, this is the uh, unobserved goal event. So how much, uh, how convinced the agent is that it did not observe the goal yet. Uh, so this is a, this example works pretty well. It's going to it's it identifies the phrases the fire truck and the globe, and it's actually going to align to them pretty cleanly in the environment. So here goes the fire truck, and here goes the globe. So it segments them as identifying pretty cleanly in the, in the environment, completing this uh, instructions uh, effectively, uh, following the correct path and reaching to the right goal. This is a more messy example, and it potentially illustrates stuff that would fail in a, modular, in a modular approach where errors are easy to cascade, but in our system, the policy actually learns to be more robust to it. So uh, here the instruction is keep the red Lego to your right. So this is the red Lego as you, as you fly around, as you mm -mm around it to face the beige fence, pass the strawberry or, uh, on your left and move forward to stop just past the globe. And this is the first person observation. And as you can see, when, when we start, the agent is pretty certain that they didn't observe the goal. Most of the mass of the green distribution is on the unobserved goal event. Now, there, you're going to see a few things once I start it. So first of all, our environment is noisy because we have all this like very complex background around the cage. And sometimes uh, the drone is going to just align to things that are completely outside of, uh, of the cage. We also, you also notice that uh, and we didn't build into our model this notion of a, a a refer an alignment should be permanent or should be consistent over time. So if you align an object, a reference to a specific object in an environment, you shouldn't align it to other objects later on, uh, even if they look uh, reasonable or the alignment will be pretty weak. You should just uh, avoid this kind of alignments. So as we as we start flying, you immediately see that some alignments to outside of the cage, and then misalignments here because the red Lego is never really seen by the first person view because we are starting on top of it. So we are aligning the strawberry to it because it's also red. So it makes sense given what we have. Uh, but you also see that the red Lego is then aligning to this uh, fire truck that, that appears at the end. The straw and, and the globe also has some kind of like a false, false positive alignments all over the place. So this is the, so this this illustrates limitation in both modeling uh, and noise in noise in the in the, in the in the segmentation. But overall, our policy learns to be uh, robust to these issues. Of course, there are certain certain uh, limitations that are uh, more damaging than usual. So this is an example of a failure. Here we have the instruction: fly straight at the red Lego up ahead, stop just in front of the red Lego, and then veer left in front of the red Lego again. So the same object is referred to over and over again. And this is an example we're not going to execute well. And what happens when you have this, uh, the same object being referred to over and over again is that you're going to get contextual representation to all of the, all of the references. And then when you get to the, when you get, and then when they get to the map, they're all being squashed to the same position where the red Lego are, is being, is being uh, identified. And that's going to wash out some of the contextual information from the different, from the different uh, mentions. 
And I'm showing here the ground truth, and you can see the drone is, would like to fly and then stop it just here next to this uh, red Lego. What you see happening instead of it is that the drone is actually going to overshoot and fly a bit uh, too far, potentially uh, mistaking the Lego with the strawberry, uh, probably because it's mixing all these different representations and doesn't really get uh, any of them well. Okay, so let's summarize. So today I, I talked overall about few shots instruction following with a quadcopter drone. I, I started by showing a few, uh, by formalizing and showing a method for few shot language condition object segmentation, where we model objects and aligning their references and observations, and we train this in, this approach with a automatically generated augment, augmented reality data. Then we take the segmentation and we construct from that an object context map. Uh, and which incorporates contextual information, text information into a spatial map without specific object of information. So everything that is within the reference has been abstracted away, which is key for the few short reasoning that the policy, uh, that the policy does later on using this map. So we integrated this into a visitation prediction policy for mapping instructions to drone control, where we generated trajectory plans over object context map plus training in simulation only by swapping the segmentation component later on to move to the real world. So there are two, from, from as far as representation design, there are two overall concepts that, were mo that I model today. Uh, these are objects and trajectories. These are very general concepts rather than modeling specific object types or, object, uh, or specific behaviors that we would like to do. Our approach leaves some open questions that uh, I think are uh, important to address in, in the future. Uh, so first of all, uh, okay, so we have this like few short approach. It raises the questions of how can we elicit these exemplars to add to a database uh, from human users, potentially within while they're interacting with uh, the system. Uh, there's also the question of how to generalize from objects to more general object types, whereas generalization is slightly harder in our approach because we specifically look at specific objects Object types, is, it will have to take this, the, the kind of generalization we have and to take it a few levels up. Uh, finally, there is also the questions of like what adult po uh, object properties should we model? And we already saw an example where uh, permanence and reference consistency are really important to model so, and can drastically improve the model behavior. The work that I described today uh, is a result of uh, several papers. The most recent one uh, includes this, uh, the, the few short reasoning in, that was just uh, presented a few days ago in Coral 2020. The other papers are in Coral 2019, Coral tw uh, uh, 18, 2018, and RSS 2018, and you can go to my website and uh, find all these papers. As pretty evident from here, all this work was done by uh, my PhD student, uh, Valtz Blokis, uh, together with a number of collaborators for, uh, over the years that were, that uh, helped with specific aspects of the system along these four papers, including the Pendle Misra, Ivid Nicholson, Natalie Buchim, Andrew Bennett, and Ross Knepper. Uh, the code is online and I, uh, and, uh, I encourage you to download it. Today. We have a, even if you're not able to create our environment, although we can help you do that, uh, you can run everything in simulation and already that allows you to do some interesting experiments. So thank you very much, and I'm happy uh, to take a question. I'm looking forward to take questions in the workshop day itself and for the discussion and the other presentations. Thank you.